From Washington to Warsaw, Paris to Ankara, Brussels, Berlin, Bucharest, and Belgrade. Through pandemics and political movements, cooperation and confrontation, digital divides, and defending democracy. The German Marshall Fund is at the pulse of transatlantic relations today, convening the experts and insights needed to navigate tomorrow's world. Hello from Washington, D.C. I'm Karen Donfried, GMF's president, and I am delighted to welcome all of you to this launch of our exciting new series on Germany after Merkel, Elections 2021. After 16 years as Germany's chancellor, Angela Merkel is stepping down this fall. There are so many questions that flow from this. What are the chances that her party colleague, Amin Laschet, will replace her? Or will the Greens continue to dominate the fragmented political party landscape and see their chancellor candidate, Annalena Baerbock, be the second woman to lead Germany? Perhaps there will be a different scenario altogether. This fall's elections in Germany will definitely not be boring. And Germany, Europe, the United States, and the world are already preparing for that post merkel future. The focus of our first event in this new series will seek to set the scene for you. We're going to kick off today with a panel discussion that is sure to be fascinating thanks to the seasoned observers of German politics participating. And then we're gonna have the first public presentation of a new Germany-focused dashboard that will allow researchers, journalists, government officials to track and compare narratives from key foreign diplomatic accounts and state-funded media outlets. And that will be presented to you by my colleague, Brett Schaefer, with our Alliance for Securing Democracy. So lots of wonderful information coming your way. And I am so happy that you're able to join us for this kickoff event. And I now want to give the floor to my wonderful colleague in Berlin, Suda David Philp. Thank you. Over to you, Suda. Thank you so much, Karen, for um, helping us get our series um, underway. Um, it's great to have you offer some welcoming words. As Karen mentioned, there's a lot of questions. The race is wide open here in Germany, and we have a stellar panel here to um, navigate us through the um, current state of the race. I'm going to start with some short introductions, and I'll have a short conversation with our panel as well. But um, I do encourage all of you to send questions to my attention through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. They'll queue up automatically and I will get to them very shortly. And then before we close, as Karen mentioned, we'll also take a look at the new Germany focused dashboard that was developed by uh, colleagues at the Alliance for Securing Democracy. First, I'd like to introduce Torsten Foss. Professor Foss is a political science professor at the FU Berlin, where he's a professor for political sociology of Germany. He focuses on elections, political attitudes, and voting behavior. Previously, he was a professor at the Johannes Gutenberg Universität in Mainz and also at the University of Mannheim. He also has a weekly podcast with uh, journalist Erhard Schäfer. Then we're going to hear from Dr. Melanie Amann, who is a member of the editorial board and Berlin bureau chief of Spiegel magazine. Before starting at the Spiegel in 2013, she also worked as a journalist for the FT Deutschland and the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. She is frequently on uh, political talk shows here in Germany. I've often seen her on Sunday nights uh, after Todd or <laughs> on Annaville or Markus Lanz um, and also the Phoenix Runda. In 2017, she wrote a book about the AFD called Angst für Deutschland, Die Wahrheit über die AFD, which traced the founding and rise of the AFD party in Germany. Then finally, we're gonna talk about foreign policy with my great colleague, Vice, uh, Thomas Kleiner Brockhoff, who is vice president at GMF and oversees our organization's activities in Germany. 
Before coming to GMF, he was advisor for Joachim Gauck, the former president of Germany. And previously to that, he was in Washington working at GMF for six years and also um, serving as the uh, bureau chief or the, the Washington correspondent for the weekly Die Zeit. Um, in September of 2019, he published a book called The World Needs the West, A Fresh Start for a Liberal Order. So Torsten, let's get started with you. Uh, you know, just six months ago, many people here were getting ready for a um, CDU-led government with the Greens as a junior partner, a so-called schwarz grun coalition. But everything has changed since then. Um, it all seems to, um, like I said before, the field is wide open. What is the state of the race? Where are the parties right now um, in, in polls? Yes, let me first of all thank you all for the invitation and also the kind introduction. Uh, but you're absolutely right. There's a, a tremendous amount of volatility in German politics these days, which is interesting because if you compare the current situation to the situation like about a year ago in March 2020, you would see poll figures that resemble the current ones quite closely. Whereas if you compare the current ones to the poll figures from, let's say, January um, in this year, you'd see tremendous changes. And what this tells us is that the pandemic has really changed German politics. It has refocused the attention and also the popularity to the current government and also more specifically to the chancellor, to Angela Merkel, her figures, but also the figures of her party, the CDU, the CSU, and the government as a, as a whole have really skyrocketed. Um, and what we have to keep in mind that previous to the pandemic, this so-called grand coalition has really been a very, very unpopular one. Their ratings were really, really poor. And it's really only due to the pandemic that we have seen this re-rise of the current government. But in most recent days, we've seen that this pandemic effect has evaporated and that now the CDU, but also the SPD are in decline and the Greens are currently, yeah, the shining stars. And I mean, if you look at polls today, you know, polls are supposed to provide a snapshot of you know, where things are politically, but we're still, you know, five months out. Can, do the polls really tell us anything right now? I mean, you talked a little bit about the decline of the catch-all parties and how the pandemic actually provided a bit of a respite for the government and boosted Merkel's favorability ratings. But I mean, what do the polls tell us right now? Are Germans, do they want change? Is, is that what it is? Or is it just because of the fragmentation in the political party landscape? Well, Germans will have changed because uh, that's, I guess, the leading topic for us today. Merkel will be history soon. And so the change that we will definitely have is a change in the chancellor position. The person that will have this office will be a different one. And so the polls these days, they do tell us something about the candidates, but also their parties. We've had two regional elections in March in the states of Baden-Württemberg and Rheinland-Palatinate, where we have seen that polls can change within rather short periods of time. And especially governing parties have gained um, support within the electorate in quite considerable, quite short periods of time in the run up to the elections. But the basis for this rise in, in poll numbers in these state elections was that each party, the Greens in Baden Württemberg, the Social Democrats in Rhineland Palatinate, they had very popular candidates. And what the campaigns achieved in these contexts was sort of to refocus this popularity of their leading candidates to their respective parties, which led to significant increases in the, in the vote shares of the parties, the Greens and the Social Democrats in the respective states. So if we transfer this argument to the election that we will have in September, that means that we'll have to look at the candidates, we'll have to look, uh, we have to look at the, the party standings these days, and what we will see is that the CDU-CSU, the governing party, is in deep trouble because their leading candidate, Armin Laschet, I'm sure we'll talk about this um, in more detail, but he's a very popular politician. His, his ratings in, in terms of knowledge, awareness are extremely high, but he's extremely unpopular. So this mechanism that he is a popular candidate that can give his party a boost will simply not work because he is not a popular candidate maybe in contrast to other parties where we see more popular candidates, even though if we think of the social Democrats, their poll standings are really, really poor these days. But there we see a mismatch of party standings, of candidate standings. So there is a chance that poll movement can arise, 
But to be honest, there's been so much dynamic in German politics, in German polls, that the only thing that is fair to say is that we really have to see how the campaign evolves, what the framing of media will be, how candidates will be portrayed. It's going to be an interesting ride up until the September election. So I definitely want to talk more about the candidates with Melanie, but before we go do that, um, Torsten, what about the voters? I mean, you mentioned that in the sense that there is no choice for the voters because there will be change. <laughs> Merkel is stepping down um, after the election. Um, but what are the issues on their minds? In, in 2015 and 16, obviously before the 2017 election, migration was a very, um, you know, a, a topic that was in mm -hmm. the headlines. What are the voters thinking about today here in Germany? And then in the context of the European election in 2019, we've seen that the climate change has been a dominant topic. These days, we have this most important problem question that is regularly asked in polls. We really see an absolute dominance of the corona pandemic. This is a situation that we have seen maybe in the, in the late 90s, the early 2000 years, when unemployment was a really, really dominant topic that 80, 90% of German population would name as the dominant, the most pressing problem that the country is facing. Right now, if you look at polls, the pandemic is, has similar shares, 80, 90%. But of course, the state of the pandemic changes these days. The vaccination programs, they accelerate. More and more people will be vaccinated soon or are already vaccinated. So that is really an open, another open question, I'm sorry. But how the agenda will be set, who is successful in setting the agenda? Each party, of course, has a different one. The climate change will give even a further boost, possibly, to the Green Party. We've seen a party convention from the Social Democrats just this Sunday where we have heard that they're, they also talk about climate change, interestingly enough, but of course they also talk a lot about the situation in, in, in urban cities with respect to flat, flat prices, social justice, of course. So the main fight that we will see is really what the frame is. What will be the perspective? What defines this election? What is it all about? Is it about the succession of Angela Merkel? Is it about climate change? Is it about the pandemic? Is it about social justice? That's not set so far, but that will be a crucial determinant that will be quite influential when it comes to the outcome. Yeah, it will definitely be interesting to see how the narrative evolves um, as we get closer to the end of September. Uh, Melanie, Torsten talked a little bit about the candidates, specifically about Armin Laschet as, um, you know, taking the torch from Angela Merkel. You know, tell us a little bit about the respective candidates, the Spitzenkandidaten for the mainstream parties, and um, specifically also about the CDU. I'd love to get your perspective um, on why um, they're doing so poorly in the polls. Um, you know, you can give our listeners a little bit of a background of sort of the internal struggles that the CDU um, has been going through that's given them a dip in the polls. T start maybe with Armin Laschet. First of all, please also let me say that I'm very happy and honored to be here and to participate in this panel. And I'm looking forward to your questions too. Um, well, as for the candidates, the interesting thing is that for the first time, there are really three candidates who are all three of them potentially uh, potential chancellors. Uh, we had this situation only once in German history with three candidates in 2002 when uh, our former or later foreign minister um, Guido Westerwelle claimed himself to be a candidate for the chancellery and he even went to the constitutional court to claim his right to participate uh, in uh, the TV debates uh, for the for the election um, unsuccessfully though and um, so but back then it was a bit of a joke because everybody knew that there would never be a chancellor Westerwelle in this case we have three candidates I mean, Laschet, you mentioned him from the CDU and uh, Annalena Baerbock, uh, you guys already talked about her from the Greens and the third candidate, the Social Democrat, Olaf Scholz. And it's very interesting to see that they have, a very, they have very different profiles, very different experience, but there doesn't seem to be much of a connection between their experience and their profile and the success that they're having in the polls as Professor Fass uh, pointed out. Maybe if we start with Armin Laschet, I mean, this, the German public has this unique chance to determine, like to choose from three candidates. None of them is an incumbent. All of them are new. And um, Laschet has the slight disadvantage that he maybe is in many ways uh, the most like Merkel, which uh, on one hand makes him 
might make him attractive to people because he's um, in many ways has shared her points of view, her policy. But um, on the other hand, he is not, he is no Angela Merkel. So obviously he will never like be able to be like her. And this will also cause people to take a closer look how much is Armin Laschet really like Angela Merkel. And then you'll see a lot of policy differences too. And um, Angela Merkel has not explicitly given him her support. She hasn't endorsed him. Uh, she hasn't even voted for him in uh, when the party elected him as their candidate. She didn't even participate in the vote. Not only did she abstain, she literally did not participate in the vote to stay as neutral as possible. So he doesn't have any boost from belonging to her party. He doesn't have any like advantage to start with um, just because he's from her. And she would probably not participate much in the campaign. She might make one appearance, maybe two, uh, and that's it. So this is uh, this is a slight disadvantage. And he does not have the thrill of the new as, for example, the candidate of the Greens does, Annalena Baerbock. Um, she is the person that people know least about, but maybe they have the clearest idea about the profile of her party, uh, what the Greens stand for, which for the moment serves both serve as her advantage. She's not very well known, but she has a very positive, fresh, new image. She makes people curious and interested. And uh, I can only stress what Professor Farr said earlier, like the, the main topic for the campaign yet has to be framed and defined. And um, if the Greens manage to keep the debate on climate change alive, then I think this will definitely play to her advantage. Um, Melanie, let's just go back to Armin Laschet just for one second. Um, you know, you're absolutely right in the sense that he was crowned chair of the party at the beginning of the year, but because of sort of some um, errors on the part of the party in terms of figuring out who would be the uh, making a messy decision about who would actually be the chancellor candidate, that certainly hurt the party. And then there were these, you know, procurement scandals with the CDU and CSU. But would you say that Armin Laschet, although he's going going in with weaker poll numbers and maybe Söder, if he had been picked as the chancellor candidate, would have been stronger in the polls at this moment now. But for the long term, do you think that maybe Armin Laschet was the right person for the party? Because we it's interesting how we're talking about the different candidates, but this is a parliamentary system. Actually, voters, you would think in Germany, would be thinking about parties and platforms and not necessarily about personalities. That's the thing. I mean, in Germany, people don't vote for a candidate, like in the United States, they vote for a party with a Spitzenkandidat, with a main candidate. So even though the, the person gets more and more important, um, the, it's still the party platform that is important and how many people can identify with the party's ideas and, and concepts. And I do think that despite all the setbacks that Laschet is suffering in the polls, um, he is probably right now still the more likely candidate to carry the prize because the city just appeals to a very broad uh, group of voters and um, be it like from all age groups and um, from all levels of society, so to say. I mean, the Greens have a very highly educated, uh, like comparatively wealthy and young uh, electorate. I'm, I'm sure <laughs> Mr. Fass knows more details about this than me, but still it, like the general uh, ideas that they have, like they have a, a they have a small spectrum. They've had a small spectrum so far. And uh, the question, the big question is, are they really, will they be able to translate the, the general popularity of their agenda into votes? I mean, we've seen it before in earlier elections that they were doing great in the polls for quite some time and then kind of nose nosedived towards the end of uh, the election and uh, towards the end of the campaign. So, I, th I wouldn't write I mean lush it off just yet and um, before I move on to Thomas uh, would you write off Olaf Schultz are we perhaps underestimating Germany's finance minister that's also been you know quite competent um, during uh, the pandemic crisis in terms of putting uh, money where his mouth is <laughs> to help Germany uh, bounce back we'll see in a few months after this crisis um, what about him? And also with Annalena Baerbock, I mean, yes, people are curious, but will she really, um, if she is, somehow makes it to the chancellery, if there is a new era in German politics where the Greens um, are um, leading a coalition, will there be a lot of change or there will be some continuity, of course, too, right? 
Um, well, as for Olaf Scholz, he's slowly turning into kind of a, a tragic uh, person or character in this whole political game. I mean, he's certainly the one with the most government experience. Um, he's been coming in and out of the chancery uh, for years now, and he's held other public offices, and he has a lot of experience how to run big political institutions, ministries, and um, like you said, he, is, he even has international experience. We don't really know what his foreign policy uh, profile is about. Uh, maybe that for your international audience, this might be interesting to point out that um, even though he's been on these international finance ministry meetings and World Bank uh, meetings or whatever, but he's not, we don't really know what his position on Russia or China or like policy wise, foreign policy wise is. Um, but, but even in spite of all this experience he has, he doesn't like, he is, doesn't manage to, um, to really gain attention, which may be due in part to his, like his personality. He has a bit of a dull uh, appearance. He is not really, a, uh, as in German we say, mention fisher, somebody who captures, uh, who catches people like fish, you know, and um, he, he hasn't really been able to like profit from this vast amount of experience and the policy that he has been making. But then again, that's a development that has struck SPD uh, for almost a decade now. I mean, ever since they teamed up with uh, Angela Merkel, um, she has managed to harvest uh, the successes that um, SPD or the policies simply that uh, uh, SPD has pushed. I remember when she got her, when she went to her Harvard commencement speech and was praised or presented as the woman who introduced the minimum wage in Germany and who introduced uh, gay marriage and everything. And it was all, all the policies that were named were policies that Angela Merkel had fought against for years and then finally accepted or uh, uh, like, and then put herself at the, at the head of, and uh, now she, they are being connected with her and not with people like Olaf Scholz. So it's, that's what I meant when I said it's a bit tragic. And, and as for Annalena Baerbock, I mean, I think this is really the, the question do the how maybe how courageous the Germans are when they enter the voting booth. I mean, this is a woman who has no government experience. She's, a, I think, she knows a lot about policy uh, and she has very clear ideas about what she, what she wants to achieve. But the question is, do people outside of the classic green spectrum trust her to really run the country? And um, I mean, polls are one thing, but in the booth, nobody knows what you're doing and where you're making your. Uh, your cross, and um, if they if they imagine Annalena Baerbock like in these ads that are being run in presidential campaigns in the U.S., like the phone is ringing at night and I don't know some crisis is going on. Do you want a sleepy Annalena Baerbock to answer the phone, or do you want maybe I mean Lasha to answer the phone? And I mean the biggest voting voter group in Germany is uh, above sixty years old, so who knows if they really uh, trust a young woman with no government experience to run the country? Well, Melanie, you just gave us a great visual to segue to Thomas's part about foreign policy. Thomas, let's talk about that phone ringing in the middle of the night. Um, if you look at the mainstream parties, what you know, what do you, what are the foreign policy stances of these parties? Are there is are there a lot of differences? Yes, there are. Um, it's it's a truism to say that foreign policy doesn't decide elections, and that probably will be true here too. But there are certainly distinctions between uh, the parties and people have different foreign policy conceptions to choose from. I would say that this country is currently in an adaptation crisis. Its foreign policy is in an adaptation crisis. It doesn't know and hasn't decided yet on how to adapt to a changing global, uh, global environment. And the election will give us a clue as to where we will go in that. Indeed, the Germans have had it had a very good since 1989. For the first time, a country felt ideologically on the right side. And for the first time, others had to adapt to how we are rather than uh, the other way around, which had been tried and failed uh, for a century or so. Um, so, uh, and you could also benefit handsomely economically from, uh, the, from the assumptions that of, of convergence theory that everybody would become like Western countries. Now the question is, is how, do, uh, how do the Germans respond to this new situation? Do they 
uh, aspire to some version of liberal internationalism redux, sort of a, a status quo ante minus, a, a, an Obama minus type situation? Or do they accept uh, what some people say is the unavoidable reality of systemic uh, systemic uh, uh, competition with China and the and and uh, and and Russia? Or is there some way of muddling through a third way? And when you take that as the threshold of the big question, then the outcome on who you vote for in in this election will make a big difference. I think the clearest position on all of these is, is Annalena Baerbock. She clearly and her party is, is accepting the, the idea of the systemic, uh, the systemic competition based on their human rights, on their democracy uh, belief set on a value base and on a universalist basis. Question to be asked to her is, um, well, what about the means of that of that policy? Uh, you know, is German foreign policy's gap between uh, uh, between the aspiration and the means getting even wider? If you are looking, and will Germans entrust her with it? Some people call, call her, especially from the social democratic spectrum, a cold warrior because of her stance vis-à-vis -vis China and, uh, and and Russia. And also one would wonder how the Greens policies on Europe, which are very nearly Euro-federalist in some cases, and uh, which also support things like European sovereignty, uh, uh, combine with this idea of a systemic Western versus the, uh, the, the authoritarians type uh, type uh, setting. Then there is, of course, this, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Christian conservatives. Uh, Laschet calls himself a realist, but I'm not sure whether that self-description is really of how, of how I would see him. He seems to me in some ways a little bit of a throwback to Helmut Kohl, sort of stepping back behind Angela Merkel in, in, in his Atlanticism, in his, uh, in his classical uh, Carolingian, German, French-based European uh, European vision, um, and and he very much is in, in a different position when it comes to when it comes to the question as to whether Germany would enter a systemic uh, a, a systemic competition. Angela Merkel has has been. Uh, the break on this so far. She is the one who was asked, don't ask us to have to decide between China and America. So I think that this election between these candidates, and I'm for a purpose omitting Olaf Scholz here, and I think Melanie Ahmad has, has, has already answered that question, because it's very hard to see the foreign policy figure of Olaf Scholz. I, can, I would be able to tell you about the modern social democracies, uh, foreign policy posture. I would be hard pressed to tell you exactly the same thing about Olaf Scholz, except for some very basic, uh, basic sentences. But I think the main choice in this election is is between those two, and be, between those two foreign policy adaptation concepts of the, uh, of the modern world that we that we as a country in Germany face. Uh, Thomas, one more question before I get to Q and A from the audience. Um, you recently wrote an article about, um, you know, Biden's 100 days and sort of the lack of uh, proactive um, reaching out on the part of the German government. So we've reached the 100 day mark, but, you know, Merkel's still in power and could still be chancellor um, till the end of the year, depending on how long it takes to form a coalition. Is there anything that the German government currently can still do now that they have sort of, um, you know, a new administration and the Trump administration in the rearview mirror. I think it 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 should not only it must, and that is for reasons of the national interest. Um, the, I mean, to preface this, one one should say that when you talk to folks in the foreign office, they see a, a sea change in relations with the United States. Uh, they see a normalization of interaction and a, a like-mindedness 
uh, that they used to be used to and weren't any longer in the last uh, in the last four years. So when when I say that the first hundred days uh, of Biden in with regard to the German American relationships ship is a hundred days of solitude, what I mean by that is that I cannot really identify what the German government has done differently because of Joe Biden, how it has invested in the new American president, what it has put on the table that is significantly different and response to the myriad of proposals and in German we say Vorleistungen, advances of the American president starting with uh, with the climate, uh, the entry, re-entry into the climate agreement to new start to uh, troops in Germany, adding troops in Germany, not withdrawing, but adding troops in, in Germany, focusing sanctions rather on on, uh, on Russia vis-a-vis uh, -vis Nord Stream rather than on Germany and risking a, a friction with the US Congress on it. So uh, the list goes on and on. And what I wonder is what the German side will want to do and put on the table to structurally reform a strained bilateral relationship. And I haven't seen that yet. And what I think it needs to do is three things. One, a symbol is needed. I, I think I see an opened arm Joe Biden and I see Angela Merkel crossing her, her, her arms in, in, in front of her and looking down. I, I don't see that same symbolic gesture. Now she isn't prone to emotional stuff. I, I get that. Um, but I think uh, it, we're in a situation where we were before in 2017 with Emmanuel Macron, who made a great op a grand opening with a Sorbonne speech with regard to European policies, created a window of opportunity to which Germany did not properly, in my view, respond. And we're in danger of doing the same thing here. So a gesture, a, a symbol is point one. Point two is, you got to take one of the irritants of the relationship uh, off the table. And that, of course, refers to Nord Stream. There are ways to address this problem. There are ways to address the, the, uh, the defense funding uh, issue in, in, in real terms without getting to 2% tomorrow. So there's got to be a, a, a little bit of creative diplomacy in, in addressing this issue. And the third thing is, I'm not seeing the German side putting the future project that we want to do together with the United States onto the table, whether that be about climate, as bo both uh, Professor Fass and Melanie Amman uh, mentioned, or whether that be about tech uh, or any future oriented issue. Why not create a clean energy bank in a transatlantic space? Why not uh, uh, go along in a, in a, in a climate alliance uh, thinking. Why not think about not the, uh, our G5 uh, uh, technology in terms of mobile, but think about jointly about G6. Companies are starting to talk about that. We need to team up technologically. So I'm looking for the future agenda and I'm looking for the German ideas to do that. Okay, so I'm gonna, there's a lot of questions that are in the um, Q&A box, lots of foreign policy questions, but there is also a really interesting question about the AFD. And I think I'm gonna give this question to both Torsten and to, um, to Melanie. Uh, you know, where is the AFD right now? This, this was the party that was the thorn in the side for the conservatives up until the pandemic hit. Um, are, is there a chance for this party now that they've also named um, a Spitzengarten.team team in the form of Vital and Schrippola? Um, is there a chance for this party to get above 10% Torsten? And Melanie, I'd like to pose the same question to you. Thank you. Well, it, it, it has been a tough time for the AFD in, in a number of respects. I mean, you mentioned it previously that their dominant issue has been the migration question, of course, in, in, in previous years. And that no longer is an issue in the agenda. They have tried to also use the climate change debate 
to, to sort of position themselves with respect to that issue as a counterpart to the Greens. They've also tried to position them, themselves in the context of the pandemic um, with groups that see the measures taken by the government very, very critical with respect to wearing masks, etc. But it has been a tough time for the AFD, but still they are at about 10% in current polls. And what that tells us is they don't have really popular candidates at their, at, uh, at their leading position. They don't really have an issue these days. So their populist stance per se seems to carry about 10% for them. Um, so the, the prospect for the party, I mean, there have been better times for the AFD. Yes, that's correct. But still, there are about 10% right now in polls for them. And I don't really see um, that this party is going to be in decline in the near future. So um, yes, 10%, 12% is a realistic outlook for them, uh, even though, again, it has been a really tough time for them. Uh, Melanie, same question to you. And maybe you can also talk about the one state election that's coming up in June, because that may be um, sort of where we'll see the AFD um, make a bit of a comeback again, that's namely Sachsen-Anhalt, um, that's in June, um, a former um, state in the former East Germany. Tell us a little bit about where you think the AFD is going, Melanie. Mm -hmm. Well, it's hard for me to add that much to what Professor Faser said. He pretty much laid out uh, the ground perfectly. I don't have much to add to that, maybe except for the also to stress that it's really fascinating that even though Policy-wise, IFD had nothing to add in the pandemic, and they have been meeting, uh, like mixing up with uh, uh, the fringe of the political spectrum and uh, the really obviously radical uh, conspiracy theorists, uh, partly anti-Semite, um, anti-Semitic. Uh, it's fascinating that their party base or their electorate doesn't seem to mind, and that the polls are this stable. I find this. Um, yeah, it's it's maybe a sobering um, sign that they are really here to stay, and it's they have, they have become to a certain extent indestructible. And if the climate change topic does become a decisive topic in the election campaign, then we might see them rise even higher, I believe, because they've always been, I mean, already the, my, um, my colleague, Mr. Faz, has already pointed it out that in the climate change topic, they are the only political party in the spectrum which like partly denies that climate change even is happening or human caused climate change is happening. And, um, and they are also a big protector of uh, the beloved uh, automobile <laughs> in Germany saying like, uh, we should stick to carbon uh, driven vehicles. And um, I think this is a position that basically no other party dares to follow in that, like that decisively. So I think they, they might have quite good perspectives. And looking at Sachsen-Anhalt, uh, you mentioned it. Um, I mean, already there, it's almost a tie between CDU uh, and AFD in that country. And we saw it during the campaign for who would become the CDU, CSU candidate for the chancellery, um, that uh, we had a quote by the Sachsen-Anhalt uh, head, of, head of state who endorsed, basically indirectly endorsed uh, um, Söder, the Bavarian candidate, because he knew that he was more popular in his own country. I mean, really, the CDU has to fear that they might end up second and that AfD might be the strongest party, and then it could be almost impossible to form a government against them or without them. And um, there are tough times ahead. And also, Saxony Anhalt is the country where there's still um, coal mining. And um, like the whole, there are groups of the population who depend on this sector and who have a very clear opinion and it's not a green opinion. So um, we might, and this will be a tough test for Mr. Laschet to pass, I think in the next weeks. So you just answered a question that was also in the um, chat about the um, CDU and uh, its decision to go with Laschet. So that's great. But before I move to Thomas for another foreign policy round, Melanie and Torsten, you know, what do you think about potential coalitions uh, after the election? You know, as I said before, when we started, everybody had in their mind CDU, CSU with the Greens as kingmaker. Um, but there are some other possibilities out there. And I know we don't have much time, but I mean, they could also, each coalition um, composition could be fun, offer fundamental 
differences for the shape of Germany domestically, but also its outlook within Europe and um, across the Atlantic. Um, go ahead, Melanie, and then we'll go to Torsten. Yeah, well, it's hard with all the options on the table to maybe I can narrow it down to the two scenarios I think might be most realistic, which is either a coalition between Laschet, uh, the CDU, CSU, and the Greens, which is also a three-party coalition. We tend to forget that sometimes. We keep talking about the two-party and the three-party coalitions, but actually CDU and CSU, as we have seen, are still two separate parties who policy-wise have quite big differences among them. So it might not make a coalition much easier just because it's only the CDU, CSU, and the Greens. Um, and the other scenario, I think, in, and the only one in which Baerbock might really have a chance for the chancellery would be um, the with her in the lead and the SPD and the FDP, the Liberals, uh, that we haven't talked about yet. And they are doing quite well. They've gotten, in the polls, they've gotten so close to the SPD that people are starting to joke, like, why don't we have a fourth uh, candidate for the chancellery? And if the SPD names somebody, why shouldn't the Liberals name somebody? Because there's... It's, they're almost like, I'm sure, I'm sure two points or so apart. <laughs> and this, of course, would be really, really new. I mean, a, a green chancellor would be new as such already, but but in the com in the combination with SPD and the FDP, it would be maybe the most exciting and most unforeseeable policy-wise um, scenario. Because, I mean, one big topic that might also come up in the election is the social question, which, of course, is a very domestic German question, might not be that interesting for your... Uh, for your viewers, but I mean, the question of how who pays for the corona pandemic consequences, like who, uh, um, how are we going to treat like low income groups? And, and this is where the AFD obviously has a very different stand from the Greens and the SPD. So this might be the most um, trying topic for them. And in, in that case, like Green and uh, CDU CSU coalition might have it much easier or might find more common ground than uh, the other group. Tarsen, what about um, your thoughts on the different color scheme that we may be seeing after September? Well, actually, I think that that is one of the most significant changes that we have seen in German politics in, in the last 20 years or so. I mean, we, we, we have experienced a time when basically German politics was very well sorted into two ideological camps, CDU, CSU and the Liberals on the one hand and, and SPD and Greens on the other. That's just 20 years ago. But it feels like it's been ages, and and the 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 variety of coalition formats that we experience these days. I mean, we have 16 states in Germany. We have 13 different uh, governments on the level of German states. That just shows you how how diverse and 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 how how, how multiplied the, the the number of formats has um, has become in recent times. And it matters. I mean, if if we look at empirical results. Um, manifestos are very, very different. Manifestos of parties, coalition agreements resemble party manifestos. And we also know that governments are very eager to fulfill their promises that they make in these um, coalition agreements. So you're absolutely right. This is not just a, an interesting question per se, but it, it has a relevance for, for public policy in many respects. And whether we have a a government of Greens, Social Democrats and the left, or whether we have a, a Laschet-led government together with the Greens. Um, what will be the outcome? I don't know, to be honest. I'm sorry that I don't know a, a lot about the outcome of this election, but it's it's just an open question. Um, when it comes to who's going to be in the lead, I mean, that might, for the Greens, be a very relevant question. Do we want to be the junior partner for Laschet in a, in a black-green coalition, or do we want to be the party that actually is in the chancellery and that Annalena Baerbock um, 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 makes sort of the, the, the successor for Angela Merkel in a coalition together with the Social Democrats and the Liberals. Um, both are realistic options, as we again have seen in the state elections in March this year. In the state of Rhineland and Palatinate, we have seen that this so-called traffic, I'm sorry for these metaphors, but so-called traffic light coalition, Social Democrats, Greens and Liberals, has been re-elected, whereas we have seen in the state of Baden-Württemberg that the Greens and the CDU, uh, the CDU there, have also been re-elected, and they have chosen to continue this this coalition. So journalists will keep on asking, "What do you? What's your your desire with respect to coalition? What coalition? Which kind of coalitions do you rule out?" This will be a very pressing question in the upcoming campaign. Actually, a question that voters 
don't really like so much because they rather want to know what what candidates stand for. But it will be, and it is a dominant question in German politics, um, and it, I'm sure that's going to be a pressing and a dominant question in the upcoming um, campaign as well. Thanks, Torsten. So a lot of the questions in the chat, you know, all of you touched upon in your remarks about, you know, how the different uh, parties think about spending, um, whether it be domestically or for the European Union as well. But Thomas, I just want to end uh, on a few questions that I'm just going to sort of tie together on foreign policy, and then we will go to the uh, German dashboard. You talked about Nord Stream 2. Um, you know, is, is that sort of the big uh, block right now when it comes to trans the transatlantic relationship? And has Baerbock signaled um, dis, you know, dismantling the project. And also, can you talk a little bit about the nuclear sharing um, umbrella and NATO when it comes to uh, the parties moving forward? Yes, of course. I've seen, uh, followed the chat and essentially when you sort of put these chat questions together is, is how, how safe are the Greens for Europe? How safe are they for our neighbors? How safe are they for the transatlantic relationship? That's the, the big bucket that, that this is in. And, and, and that speaks to your question. Nuclear sharing. Um, the, uh, the Greens come from a pacifist tradition. Their goal is global zero. Their goal is to end the nuclear sharing agreement and to have no longer have uh, nuclear weapons, as few as there still are, American nuclear weapons uh, stationed in Germany. That said, uh, and, and by the way, uh, Annalena Baerbock has said so much and, and she has said that the, the program says it, Baerbock has said it pre-nomination uh, pre in, in, in her main foreign policy speech. However, she will not, even if she were to become chancellor, govern this country alone. Um, she will be in a coalition and then that question becomes relevant. Uh, so I, I would expect the Greens to be willing to compromise on this with whomever they will be in coalition with, whether it's a, a social democratic uh, or more likely a Christian democratic conservative uh, coalition partner and their leadership. When you look at the biggest difference that I see is between their very pragmatic leadership and their own party base. Imagine a wave of green MPs coming into parliament uh, that come from rank and file and have true blue or true green uh, convictions having no political experience being freshman parliamentarians uh, and having a, pragmat a pragmatist uh, uh, Annalena Baerbock. So I see as much frictions about foreign policy between the parties on key questions as, as is nuclear sharing. And behind that is the whole agenda. Uh, and somebody asked about the Munich, uh, the Munich consensus. Will the Greens uh, follow that through? So I see frictions between the coalition partners as well as within the Green, uh, the Green Party itself, should it come to that. Nord Stream 2, Annalena Baerbock, the, all of the Greens have been the only, uh, as a party group, staunch opponents to Nord Stream 2 from, for years now. Uh, and, and so is Baerbock. Now, she has not said that she will abandon the project, but she has used a different, a different term. And that term is she will withdraw political support to the project. Now go figure what that means uh, it, it, in a project that is 92% finished and has a, a legal permit. So does that mean you will somehow fiddle the issue? Clearly she is willing, and that is different to the current chancellor, she is willing to take the, the issue off the board. She understands that this is an irritant uh, in, in, in inner European relations, in European and, and by the way, in relations with Ukraine, but certainly with the United States in a, in a broader sense. So she's willing to compromise on it, but it doesn't mean committing to ending 
with the pipeline project. So I want to thank our panelists. Uh, you know, we're going to use the last 10 minutes to talk about the Germany dashboard. So stick around if you'd like. Um, but, you know, you've opened up a, opened up our series in a great way. We couldn't ask for better comments. Torsten, Melanie, Thomas, thank you so much for your insight. There's a lot to talk about, and we hope that all of you will join us for future events. We'll have one, another one on foreign policy, specifically with the German political parties next week. Thank you again. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Brett Schaefer. He is with the Alliance for Securing Democracy. He is a media and disinformation fellow there, and his research has has appeared in many um, publications of record, such as the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And he's done um, several interviews for different broadcast outlets, such as um, NPR. He is also the creator and manager of Hamilton 2.0, which tracks state-backed messaging from Russia, China, and Iran that target audiences across the globe and has inspired a tool for the German elections, which he's gonna show us, um, which we uh, have to thank OSF for its generous funding to make this project possible. Um, and it is a little bit different and he can explain that because it tracks both foreign and domestic messengers targeting German audiences. Um, and it's a dashboard that we're doing in conjunction with the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. And there will be additional partners um, being named in the coming weeks. So um, with that, Brett, I'm gonna hand the floor to you and I'm looking forward to hearing about this new tool. Thanks, Suda. And I'm just gonna share my screen here so we can do a, a brief demo. Okay, so as Suda mentioned, this is based off of our Hamilton 2.0 dashboard, which tracks uh, over 900 Twitter accounts connected to Iranian, Chinese, and Russian diplomats and state media. It tracks four channels on YouTube and roughly a dozen state media websites. So what the dashboard is able to do is it gives us a pretty good summary analysis every day of the key topics and themes that these countries are talking about. So we're able to sort of scroll through, see which accounts are getting the most amplification, and also look at the key phrases, the hashtags, the countries being mentioned, as well as the individual tweets that are getting uh, a lot of retweets, a lot of engagement, and then, as I mentioned, also look at their outputs on YouTube and across state media websites. But one of the limitations with the dashboard that we had noticed is it's quite difficult uh, to actually run uh, country or regional specific analysis because it requires the user to go through and select all of the accounts uh, individually. So obviously not many people know the Twitter account handle for the Iranian ambassador in Berlin. So it's just a really time consuming endeavor. The other limitation is that it looks at st state media and state messaging in isolation. If there's anything we learned in the US context, it's that you cannot look at the foreign without understanding the domestic. And so we realize that it's uh, sometimes very limiting to do analysis and not understand how it uh, converges or diverges from political rhetoric or just what's in the domestic media ecosystem. So the German election dashboard is hoping to solve those two issues. And I'm just gonna try to minimize my here so it's not blocking us. Okay, it tries to solve those two issues by looking at the state-backed actors. We also added in Turkey here just because of the obvious influence of the diaspora in Germany. But what we have is a pretty robust uh, set of domestic actors as well. So we have most of the major German media outlets, as well as accounts affiliated with the major political parties. So we have now roughly 800 Twitter accounts in the domestic space, and that gives us a much better ability to run the sort of side-by-side -side comparisons that allow us to see uh, how foreign actors are either piggybacking off the messages that are in the domestic space or trying to redirect the conversation. So what you see on the landing page is just a very quick sort of rundown of election related hashtags and, and key phrases and which network are amplifying those specific hashtags or uh, key phrases. The Turkish ambassador gets mentioned in almost every single tweet, or not the ambassador, the foreign minister gets mentioned in almost every single tweet. So we may have to mute that, but this is just a very quick kind of intro to the top line data. But most of the time I'm gonna spend looking at the individual parts of the dashboard we, where we can do deeper analysis. So again, we have Twitter, we have YouTube and we have websites. And just a couple things to note, I'm gonna do everything in English, but there is the ability up here to toggle to German. 
So the dashboard will be bilingual at a certain point. I'm also just gonna go to many different tabs. I've learned from experience that trying to screen share and run a live demo is a recipe for a very slow experience. So everything on the dashboard is interactive. I am gonna be toggling between the tabs just to make sure everything works. So if I hit the Twitter button here, it takes me to this page that gives me an overview of, I think I set the date range to 30 days, but this is customizable. So you can look at one day, you can look at the last six months at a certain point. And that allows me to see which accounts are the most influential. So which accounts are getting the most retweets and also just the themes that are being amplified the most in the German uh, ecosystem. So of interest, Every account here is a domestic German account with the exception of RT Deutsch, which is the fourth most influential account that we're looking at. Again, this is over 850 accounts, including major German media outlets and political figures. That will be a theme throughout is that RT Deutsch has outsized influence. So what you'll also see here are the most mentioned hashtags. So most of these are pretty generic, not that interesting. This, however, is a little bit more so because obviously it gets into then questions about lockdown, the translation of this is close everything. So if I were to click on that, it would then reorient the dashboard to just show me all of the uh, related metrics around that key phrase. As you'll see again, RT Deutsch, one of the main amplifiers of that hashtag. And if I were to say, well, I'm not interested in what's happening in the domestic space, I just wanna look at how the Russians are messaging around that. I could click through here, oops, and it'll get me just to the German messaging, or sorry, the Russian messaging around it. And so I can see again exactly what the Russians are talking about when they're using that hashtag. And we have every tweet here that users can scroll through to get a better sense of how they're framing the conversation. So. If you were to look though for something that's not appearing among the top 10, there's also always the option to run a specific search. So on that topic, you could look at things like Notbremse. Again, I think that sort of translates to the emergency break, what we call the sort of lockdown or quarantine measures here. And we will see every single account that has used that key phrase. You'll notice it's unsurprisingly the German media, German politicians, but then also Russian state media. So those seem to be the only two people talking about it. The Chinese, the Iranians are not messaging around that. And again, you can click through any of these accounts, any of the related metrics and get more information on those. So besides that sort of broad overview, one of the things we were able to do in, on our Hamilton 2.0 dashboard is look at the messaging around vaccines. So if you run a specific vaccine like Pfizer, again, you can get the related metrics. But if you go to this section here, it says compare you can run actually side-by-side -side comparisons. So I was able to put in Sputnik vaccine, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and you're able to see the trend lines over time. So this is a great way of looking at how, uh, how there's messaging around specific candidates, for example. So you could put in all of the key candidates or the parties here, and you can see how each individual network, again, if I select the countries up top here, are messaging around a specific candidate or topic and do those sort of side-by-side -side comparisons. One of the other things we can do, and this is the Twitter analysis page, is you can look at who uh, they're retweeting. So who kind of exists in their amplification network outside of the accounts that we know to be attributable state-backed actors. And occasionally this leads to some very sort of interesting findings. One of the things we found on Hamilton 2.0 doing this, and there was a big report today about this, is how often uh, Chinese diplomats actually retweet accounts that we are quite certain are fake. And so this is one of the ways that will help identify that because it will highlight the accounts that they are engaging with. So for example, you look at Xinhua Deutsch, you see that they've retweeted, this is definitely not a fake account, but it is an account that talks about climate issues. So you can click into that and see exactly what their messaging is, why they engage with that account. It just gives a deeper level of analysis than simply looking at the state actors themselves. And just very quickly, because I know we're running out of time here, but I did want to mention that we also have, if you click on the YouTube little button here, you can go and get a summary analysis of everything RT Deutsch is putting out on their YouTube channel. So we rank things by views, but you can also select things by likes, dislikes, comments, 
And it gives a great way to scroll through on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, and just see the themes that the Russian media ecosystem is using to target audiences in Germany. And then finally, just to wrap things up here, because I know we're at time, we also have all of the German language uh, state-backed media accounts from the foreign networks that we're looking at. So once again, you'll see a theme. RT Deutsch absolutely dominates in terms of engagements. Actually, R or, sorry, Sputnik, which has now been rebranded as SNA in Germany. Sputnik is more prolific in the articles they put out. RT Deutsch gets the most engagement, much less so from Turkish, Iranian, and Chinese state media. But the purpose of the dashboard is to give users the control to search for anything they want, to run these side-by-side -side comparisons, uh, to look at the topics and themes that are being promoted by each network, and then to be able to do, uh, you know, really deep sort of longitudinal analysis over time and say that, you know, over six months, these clearly are the themes that the Russian media ecosystem, Chinese diplomats are going back to over and over again. Uh, and we think it's just an, an excellent tool for providing that sort of deeper level of analysis and just sort of anecdotally saying, well, I went to RT Deutsch today and they were talking about this. Uh, and hopefully will be a useful tool for those who are analyzing uh, the information space around the election. And I will wrap up there because I know we're at time. Thank you, Brett, so much. I mean, it really wasn't a lot of time, but you gave us a really good snapshot of this powerful tool that I think a lot of people will use as a resource during the, this election year in Germany. Thanks to all of you that have tuned in um, for our kickoff event on our series, um, you know, Germany um, after Merkel, Choices for Germany. You'll, there'll be another event next week specifically on foreign policy with Bundestag members and uh, their respective views on foreign policy uh, representing the mainstream parties. Thank you. Have a good evening. Enjoy the rest of your morning. Bye-bye.